Hello everyone, my name is Karina. I go by Cartsy on social media, and today's video is all about everything that I made for my university's production of Shrek the Musical. From puppets to helmets, all the way up to this big floofy pink tutu. The more school goes on, the harder it is to produce videos at the rate that I used to, but I do have quite a few videos that have been recorded and, and costumes have been being built over the course of the months that I am that I'm currently editing to put out into videos soon. This video is going to be split up into three builds, so if you'd like to skip ahead to certain timestamps to, to um, builds that you're most interested in, you can go ahead and do so. I have the timestamps here. There is one for the Gingy Puppets, then there is um, Shrek's Helmet, and of course the Sugar Plum Fairy Tutu. But first, a little bit of, into exactly what Shrek the Musical is. So Shrek the Musical is obviously an adaptation of the 2001 animated film Shrek. It opened in 2008 with the music by um, G9 Tesori and the lyrics by David Lindsay Abair. And I'm sorry for my pronunciations, but the names are on screen. For what I know from conversations with classmates and friends, it's quite common for other, especially high schools, to put up productions of Shrek the Musical. Even in my junior year, I remember in high school that we actually did our own production of Shrek. I didn't get to see the play, unfortunately, but I heard it was great. But after reading the script and then going into dress rehearsals and watching it on stage, I, I found that the play actually has a lot of interesting tidbits and things that expand on the world of Shrek. For instance, in the song, The Ballad of Farquaad, it's uh, told to us that um, um, Farquaad's father is actually Grumpy the Dwarf, and it's implied that his mother was um, the princess from The Princess and the Peas. We also get to see Shrek's origins in the beginning of the play, with him being pushed out to live on his own by his parents at the age of seven, and um, parallel. this is paralleled by Fiona, who at the same time in the play is getting pushed out by her own parents to go live in a tower by herself, also at the age of seven. Suffice to say, the play is extremely funny, and I am most assuredly biased when I say this. However, I do think that we had some great performances in our own production and work by my fellow classmates and faculty. So that's a little proud, like, me for everyone moment. <laughs> so without further ado, let's journey into the magical world of Shrek, where ogres have layers. The buttons, not the gumdrop buttons. This particular semester, they offered an independent study class um, that was two classes pretty much in one. It was millinery, which is a fancy term for hat making, and puppetry. Now we're going to dive into the puppetry portion of this because the reason why um, these, this class was offered this semester was purely um, so that one, students can learn skills, but also that we can apply those skills in time to building things for the show itself. So we were given a whole list of different things that the show needed. And as the show, as um, early production went on, we decided to figuring out who was doing what. So for this particular production, we needed gingy puppets. And I decided that I wanted to take on the gingy puppets pretty much because Sugar Plum Fairy, which is the build I already knew I was making for the show, the actress voices Gingy and holds Gingy in a lot of the a lot of these scenes. So I knew that the puppet was already kind of living with the costume I was building, so it wasn't too far of a stretch to go ahead and do that, and that would be one less person to communicate to. Originally, Gingy was gonna be one puppet, but as the um, production early production went on, um, we decided that the puppet needed to be two. Um, for practical reasons on stage. So one permanently mounted to the cookie sheet um, for the torture scene, and then one um, is like fr like free for the arm to hand operate, so away from the cookie sheet. To pattern Gingy, I first drew him on brown paper and played with what proportions looked best. As you can see, the first Gingy was later cut down smaller and then proportioned to the cookie sheet. I cut off his legs unevenly to give the appearance of them being snapped off randomly. Uh, once the cookie cutter template was ready, it was time to cut him out of the upholstery squishy foam. I marked the foam with a sharpie and then went to work at the bandsaw in the scene shop at my school. It was pretty simple to cut, the hardest part being the armpit. Gingy's details were made of Crayola model magic and sculpted to mimic his frosting squiggles, blue brows, white eyes, and of course his gumdrop buttons. Believe it or not, but his mouth was made with a chip bag clip that was cut narrower at the bandsaw. It was covered with red fabric and then inserted into a slit created in his mouth. Hot glue was used to attach all the details on, including his red lips. The torture scene Gingy was then mounted on the cookie sheet made by my instructor Mandy Wood. She cut out a hole at the top big enough for the handle to poke through 
and he looked great. Now, the Genji being operated by hand and used in the dance choreography needed one leg attached. In the final fitting, I brought in Genji and glued the leg closest to the waist of the puppet with a ribbon. We needed the leg to be able to move from a sitting position on the tutu to a standing position when held higher or jumping. So at first the ribbon worked, but at the first dress rehearsal, the puppet was brought back to me with the ribbon coming off. So I came up with a quick solution and with my emergency sewing kit, I sewed his leg on, giving him some real stitches. The leg stayed on great and survived through all the rehearsals and performances, much to my relief. And that is how the Gingy puppets were created. I think they came out super cute. And if you're wondering where his other, his other leg went, I have it. <laughs> I, I have helmet hair. As soon as I got the headwear list for possible production assignments for a Shrek musical, I can, I read through the list and completely like dive straight in, like emailing my teacher right away once I saw what I wanted. And that was Shrek's helmet. So. I have done armor in the past. I have worked with foam for my Princess Allura costume, and I also dabbled with foam, foam but with mostly Warbla in my um, Kyoshi Warrior cosplay. So I have like like traversed this world a little bit before of working with like armor things, but I never have done a helmet before. And I thought, wow, this would be a great way to expand my portfolio and try something new. So I was very excited for this one. The patterning phase was super fun and pushed my brain to think about shapes differently. The design I was given was from images of the original helmet from the Broadway production of Shrek the Musical. I drew out ideas of what the shapes were, counted my pieces, and went to work trying my hand at drafting it out on brown paper. At first, it was a bit wonky looking, but the more I fiddled with it, the better it became. The major thing about this helmet that I was thinking about while making it is that it needed to be able to fit over the Shrek prosthetics. Here you can see my first draft sitting on top of the early prosthetic sculpt. This sculpt was done by my classmate Catherine Pogar, who did all the uh, Shrek prosthetics and makeup for the show. And yes, I am shamelessly inserting her Instagram here because she does cool work, so go check her out. The first helmet draft needed the back to extend a bit and the front to come forward more. Once I thought it was reaching a good point, I switched to creating the final pattern out of cardstock. I stapled my patterns together to see what worked and proportionally looked good. And that's when the helmet started coming to life. The pattern pieces laying flat looks really cool in my opinion. This like so many interesting shapes. The helmet was marked with a highlighter and cut out of six millimeter EVA foam. And here is a safety warning. I used contact cement to put the helmet together and I should have been using a respirator more and gloves. Don't be me and be safe. I'm currently updating my safety knowledge and will be correcting my ways for future builds. After pieces of the base of the helmet and one horn were assembled, I chucked the helmet into a fitting with Forrest Stringfellow, the actor playing Shrek, who did a wonderful performance, might I add. Forrest and I were in the same acting class a while ago, so when I heard he got casted for the row, I was completely ecstatic. I'll have the interview he did with another UCF student, Andres Purcell, linked in the description below. So the helmet fit well, but there were two issues to fix. The horn needed to point up more instead of out, and the ear holes needed to be adjusted. It was discovered that the ears were just slightly asymmetrical, with one ear being more forward than the other, so I marked with highlighter where each hole needed to be adjusted. I patterned the new horn and cut out the rest of the helmet details. A lot of tiny circles and strips were cut out from black craft foam. The horns were cut at an angle and glued and all the decoration was attached. Then I dremeled the pieces and attached the horns. It was then ready for a paint job. The helmet was sprayed with plastic dip and then painted with metallic silver FX paint, and it took quite a while. I must have been just extremely exhausted at that point because sitting and painting the helmet felt super tedious, but I got it done. Then the helmet was sent off to rehearsal. At the first dress rehearsal, I was told that the helmet was actually coming off Forrest as he was doing a lot of extreme movement in the scenes that he had the helmet with. So um, during first dress tech, I got some elastic and some barge and I quickly inserted a strip um, right into the helmet, which helped keep the helmet from knocking off him when he was moving around. And here's a clip of me doing um, a little helmet test to see if the elastic worked and would knock off my head or not. Overall, the helmet was a success and it looked great on stage and I'm super happy with it. What are you doing in my swamp? So the Sugar Plum Fairy costume is quite possibly the most complex costume I have made to date. Um, because of all the different techniques and skills and things I had to learn to be able to create that structured, um, like that structured tutu and bodice and all the decor. And it just, it took a lot out of me. 
So Sugar Plum Fairy, although not in the original um, animated films of Shrek, is in the musical of Shrek. And she gets cast away with all the other fairy tale creatures from Duloc to Shrek's Swamp. One of the costume designers for the show, Hannah Parsons, designed her to be covered in sweets. She is dressed in classical ballet attire because she comes from the Nutcracker Ballet. This is the finished rendering design given to me by Hannah, Instagram link below, and is what I went off of to figure out the drape. After getting the actress Hannah Ariel's measurements, I padded a dress form to her shape and went to work pinning with twill tape the design lines and draping the bodice in the basque. I have made a ballet bodice before in a previous semester, but never patterned one, so this was an interesting change. After the first fitting, it was clear that the bodice needed to be adjusted, so I fixed the front curve and flatlined the front V with a muslin material to stop the fabric from stretching and provide better support. The final bodice was cut out of a white cotille for the inside structure and a pink cotton for the fashion fabric exterior. These layers were flatlined together by hand on a curved bounce board. Then I cut bias strips out of a red and white striped fabric and sewed cording in between it to create a candy cane piping. I sewed all the pieces together, sewed the boning channels, cut the bones to size, rounded the steel off, and inserted them in. And this was the resulting bodice. Some super pretty fabric was found for the costume that was covered in sparkles that made it look like sprinkles and like sweet candy. After being given the fabric, I laid it out and cut different pieces, pinning them onto the bodice and various designs to figure out the layout. The plan was to applique the pieces by hand onto the bodice to create a beautiful design, and it was beautiful. It nearly murdered my fingers to accomplish it, but it was worth it, and it was also satisfying. I know we just got to the sparkly bits, but now is a good time to rewind the clock and start at the beginning of the construction process of the tutu itself, because it was fairly new to me and intricate, and deserves a whole portion right to itself. Now the tutu started out with the draping of the basque, the fabric layer you see under the bodice that connects to the tutu. Then the flat patterning of the which is the area where the net and the tool is sewn to. All these patterns went through lots of development to accomplish a good fit. The knickers have 12 lines drawn onto the pattern, evenly distributed as well, where each layer is sewn along it. To create this foundation layer, my instructor ordered a cotton bobby net, which is a beautiful material used in tutu making. Unfortunately, everywhere was sold out of white bobbinets, and the only place it, that really sold it was the UK, but that wouldn't get to us to, to, on time to meet our deadlines. So we settled for an ivory instead. At first, it didn't look like the ivory bobbinet would make it to the fitting we needed it for, so some poly bright yellow bobbinet was pulled from stock um, for the mock-up. This ultimately didn't get used in the fitting because the ivory one came right before, um, but both were quilted by the machine creating one inch by one inch squares. This was done with two layers of the fabric with one running on the cross grain and the other on the warp. The goal of this was to make the knickers have a lot of structure and to support the tutu itself. And although the yellow one wasn't used, it did serve as a good fabric base to do some practice samples with. Once quilted, the knickers were cut, marked with disappearing ink where all the layers are sewn, and then those lines of ink were then thread marked so that when the ink disappears, we had those lines still there. And then it was onto sewing the channels for the elastic. This took a couple trial and error samples to figure out exactly the right width for the channel and to make sure that I was sewing it correctly because there was one portion that had to get snipped into, so I wanted some practice before I went into the real thing. The knicker pieces were sewn together and so was the basque, which was cut out of a cotille. And after sewing on three layers of net, it was ready for its fitting. The fitting helped note what areas needed to change, but pretty much I could start jumping into the colorful world of the tutu. Now, it may be difficult to keep track, but listen carefully. So for this particular tutu, my designer wanted it to have lots of color and a scattered but balanced pattern. She selected for me to use three colors of net, a white, a fuchsia, and a pink, and then three colors of glitter tulle this lighter blue, this darker blue, and this darker pink that leans towards fuchsia. Contrary to popular belief, a tutu isn't made of exclusively tulle, but it's made of mostly a net material. Net is a less floaty and more structured material that ensures that the tutu keeps its shape. Whatever the glitter tool was, it needed to be backed with a net material because tool can't be a layer by itself because of how lightweight it is. But remember, there are 12 layers to the tutu and each layer needed multiple colors to give the scattered color effect. This led to the development of a tutu key to help my brain keep track of everything. The capital letters being net layers and the lowercase layers, layers being tool. This was especially helpful in the cutting process because each layer is cut at different lengths and widths. The widest and most dense being at the top 
and becoming progressively less as you go down. Uh, this particular tutu that we made uh, is 15 inches wide at its widest point and the top layer, and then it goes all the way down to the smallest layer being two inches wide. It was very, very important to keep track of everything. So I kept safety pins with like little, um, like little paper notes of what layer, what, what number they were like pinned onto each each little bundle to make sure that I kept track of what colors were going where. But after the layers were cut, it was onto the dagging. Yes, there's more to cut. Dagging is the decorative cut design on the edge of the tutu. There are two main types, soft looking scallops and sharp looking zigzags. I opted for the scallops for my tutu because I thought the roundness of it would match the roundness of the other uh, candy decorations that'd be added later on. So I made three templates. The largest template is used for the four top layers because they are the most um, dense, they get gathered the most. So to see the scallop, you, re um, you really require a bigger um, template for it. And then the other ones are obviously for the middle one and then the bottom one is the smallest template. After all the cutting was done, it was onto sewing each layer's colors together and onto the shuffling by machine. Okay, so shuffling is when you basically pre-pleat the material by machine to the length it needs to be sewn onto the tutu. This is done with each layer being shuffled in the opposite direction than the other to keep the tutu from shifting. Overall, this makes it easier to sew the tutu onto the knickers because once the, the process starts, it starts getting crowded at the machine. But enough of that. After the shuffling, reattaching the knickers to a pink basque to match the bodice, sewing the knicker placket and cleaning up the inside, and then sewing on the Peter Chan tape at the top, it was time to sew all the layers on. I am not without my mistakes. Somewhere along the line, I placed the tutu channel on the wrong layer. So I had to push the tutu back to the machine and sew in a two inch wide white net channel so that we could insert the steel tutu wire. This hoop helps the tutu keep shape and bounce back. With that corrected, I could continue with closures and tacking. So tacking is the action of taking about four ply of thread and hand sewing points of the tutu. The goal is to catch tutu layers, almost like a U shape, and keep them together, hence the word tack. This helps the tutu go from a fluffy shape to a pancake shape. The tutu is closed up with hooks and eyes, hand sewn into the back. A piece of grass grain tape was used to help reinforce the bobbinet part of the placket. I then began decorating the tutu with the same glitter applique as the bodice. It all got hand sewn onto the mask, and then the pointed design that was cut was tacked onto the tutu. Hannah, the designer, brought in these lovely peppermints that she made from foam clay and covered in glitter. I hand sewed these onto the tutu along with some pink glitter tool that was used as a swag design. And this is the finished sugar plum tutu. I really could not be more happier with this. The amount of work that went into this was a lot, but the end result was so sweet, pun intended, so much glitter and pink and just, just looking at it makes me very happy. The back closes with a separating zipper where you can see how the applique matches up wonderfully. Then there are two skirt hooks and three buttons with elastic buttonholes attaching the inside front of the bodice to the basque. Now, there is one more element of this costume that I have to mention, and those are the wings that my designer Hannah made. I sewed hidden channels into the bodice specifically to hold them in, and when they are on, they are just simply the most beautiful things ever, and they sparkle, and everything's just this most beautiful pink sparkliness. Unfortunately though, they were cut from the show due to some issues during rehearsal, but they were simply just too beautiful not to sh for me to show them off, because th they, they are gorgeous, as simple as that. So shout out to my designer, Hannah, for making some beautiful wings and all the other work that she did, along with all my other classmates. Uh, we really pulled together something really awesome and all because of all of our hard work and imaginations. And there was like a period of time where many of us in the costume shop just kept coming in day after day with like no days off. The worst for me was 12 days straight. Uh, I know for one of my other classmates, they, they spent like a month coming in day after day. So I want to take a moment to give shout outs to a bunch of my friends and classmates who worked on the show because they just simply did a great job. From the cast to the crew and the technicians who built everything, we did it guys and we survived. Man, the muffin.